Chapter 8, Rolling on the River. Inquest number 78. The college semester in Paris is over. Even though her father does not like her driving at night, Misty is determined to get home from Paris Junior College in Paris, Texas. The 19-year-old drives south to Bogota and then down to Mount Vernon. Then she crosses Lake Monticello, making her way through Pittsburgh on her way south through northeast Texas. It's 20 years before cell phones will be common, and even now there are miles and miles of woodlands and territories throughout East Texas without bars. That's either bars for drinking or bars indicating cell phone reception. Misty has to be careful traveling through the many small towns. Each one has a policeman shooting a radar gun to make the highways safe and help fill the city coffers. In Gilmer, a city cop is not quite hidden, and she almost runs a red light straining to see him instead of paying attention to the light over the intersection. On State Highway 155, she makes the turns in the red lights in Big Sandy and continues south. The four lanes of Highway 155 narrow ahead as she approaches a two-lane bridge. A big truck takes advantage of the passing lane and blows by, shaking her gas-saving little car and cutting in in front of her as the extra lane closes. She gives the 18-wheeler plenty of room. Let him run the front door, she says to her imaginary passenger. It's an expression her father uses. If a ticket is to be given, it will be for the big rig that runs ahead. The trailer lights fade quickly as she approaches two bridges. That truck is going way too fast. The first bridge crosses Pump Station Lake. The next crosses the Sabine River. The river is the dividing line between Smith County and Gregg County. Five miles further south, and you're at the blinking light in downtown Winona. The thump, the thump, the thump. A group of men standing around a blazing campfire under the bridge hear the sound of vehicles passing overhead. The Sabine River slowly flows by. The fire is energized every time someone throws a cardboard box into it. Blues, greens, and some strange colors flame off of the boxes. It's as though the fire is celebrating the end of another 6, 12, 18, or 24 pack of beer. Freedom is the feeling on the river. There's no social age or boundary within the group. The usual prerequisite for respectable living fade into the distance with the th thump of the vehicles speeding away. Life goes on at 60 or 70 miles an hour up on the bridge, but down here, Life below is on hold. On the river, one does as little or as much as whatever one likes. William likes a combination of alcohol and pain pills, a combination that's sometimes fun and sometimes fatal. William spins around in a wheelchair. The firelight reflects off the chrome that's not covered in mud. He feels he has done all he can to get some pleasures out of life. A ruined spinal cord has kept him in the wheelchair for at least four of his 29 years. His legs are nothing but dead weight, more of a hindrance than a help. He is determined to do some of the things he once did, however, including going to the river with the guys. This is what the river is all about, William says as he rocks back in his chair, balancing on two wheels. Then he does a 360 spin. The two small front wheels land in front of the fire, and the blaze reflects off the flame, giving it a fiery orange look. Even though he's drinking, he could still maintain his balance, rocking back and forth and using his hands on the big wheels. The chair has replaced his legs. He's learned to control the wheelchair like some control a pair of skis or skates. This is what it's all about, William says. There's something special about getting away from the civilized world, building a fire and standing around telling stories with friends and strangers. William thinks, but he cannot stand. He has to sit. He cannot hop up into the boat and run the trot lines. He cannot jump into the car and run back to Big Sandy for another six-pack. He has to depend on others. He has stories to tell, but his stories always begin with, before the accident, and end with a sigh, as though his life ended with the loss of his legs, and the rest of his body painfully lingers on. The Sabine River's been hearing stories since the days when the Indians camped along its muddy banks. Some things have changed. There was no Highway 155 in wilderness days, of course. The Indians heard the scream of a big cat, 
the hoot of an owl, and the deep rumbling belching sound of a bullfrog or alligator. Sounds still heard deep in the river bottom. Camping Indians did not hear the the thump, the thump sound of progress. The thump, the thump, the thump. Misty hears the sound as her tires slap against segment after segment on the first bridge. The car rocks in rhythm to the sound. Instinctively, she holds the steering wheel tighter and becomes more aware. The bridge is a hundred yards long and broken into concrete segments, separated by spaces of one-quarter to three-fourths of an inch. The distance varies with the temperature. On this July night, at 11.14 p.m., the space is half an inch. The full moon reflects off the lake and provides enough light to outline a tall pine forest. The headlights make everything else appear as in black and white. Up on 155, the people in cars and trucks move on without a clue of the activity below the bridge. The people under the bridge think, We are safe in our sanctuary here in the river bottom. That the thumps are a reminder of the world above them, but not a deterrent to the activities. In fact, it adds a certain thrill. Under the bridge, the fire is smothered and dimmed momentarily, falling victim to another 24-pack beer box. The box discolors as it heats up to kindling temperature. Strange colors appear as small fingers of green and blue flame caress a fading picture of mountains and words that claim the goodness of this brand of beer. Light flashes as the box ignites, sending glowing ashes up and away. The fire prevails. The concrete columns and the rusty steel beams of the undercarriage of the bridge are revealed. Overhead, the shadows dance with the flames. William sits in his wheelchair. He sees the glowing ashes drift weightlessly away, unbound by Earth's gravity. They are free to drift and fly until they disintegrate, turn to powder, and no longer exist. You remember that time the river rat came by? Another story begins, and attention is focused on the storyteller by all save one, William, who rolls away in his wheelchair. The rutted dirt road that runs beside the highway would be difficult to walk by moonlight. It's a hundred yards of rough uphill terrain. William's wheelchair rocks and rolls with the battle to get up to Highway 155. The rider's hands are reddish-brown from the sticky clay and dirt that now covers the wheels. The smaller front wheels bump up as the chair hits the ridge of the asphalt shoulder of the road. The chair jerks over the edge and forward to sit up on solid pavement. William thinks of his chair as another vehicle on the highway. He's back in the modern world. A car approaches and the bright white headlights change the surrounding view from the black and white of moonlight into color. William looks at his red muddy hands. Would I complain if my shoes were caked with mud, he wonders. He remembers the whipping he got from his mother the time he tracked that dog poop into the house. How he wishes his legs would work again. I'd gladly jump into a pile of shit if I could, he thinks as the car whooshes by. Now I can't even feel the sting of Mama's hand on my butt. After fighting the muddy dirt road, the chair glides easily along the paved shoulder of Highway 155, going back towards the bridge. The wheelchair vibrates as it rolls over hundreds of tiny pebbles embedded in the black asphalt. Perhaps William is tired of looking up at his friends. From the vantage point of the bridge, he can look down upon them for a change, thirty feet down to the river. William hears the compressed sounds of waves of an eighteen-wheeler approaching. He feels the energy of the truck as it roars by at seventy miles an hour and only eight feet away. The ground shakes and the wind tosses his hair. He smells diesel, a manufactured oily fuel smell. The smell drifts away and is replaced with the natural smell of burning pine from the campfire below. Once I took my daughters to the river and the Schamburger Lakes to show them how much fun it could be. The gate changes keys frequently and the key I had would not fit. So we parked the red rodeo, climbed the fence, and proceeded to walk the half mile down the blacktop road. We were wearing our swimsuits and carrying our towels. My swimsuit was a pair of cut-off jeans with a margarita wine cooler in each front pocket. We walked by the little lake and the place where my son and I had once seen a large alligator. It was near the spot where my fly fishing days came to an end. As a child, I remembered Cousin Carl Schamberger 
majestically smoking his pipe and fly fishing on the lake. In the early morning, with a low foggy mist upon the lake, he would sit or stand in the boat, flexing and swaying the long rod, feeding the fiber out, making a super large S above his head. Then he would gracefully lay that filament down to that intimate spot where he hoped a hungry bass would be waiting. Attached to a heavier fiber line would be the light nylon fishing line, and delicately attached to that, a fly. Hidden in the fly is a hook. I decided I'd carry on this tradition, I told the girls as we walked down the tree-covered roadway. As I spoke, I could hear a droning sound in the river bottom, like a chainsaw in the distance. After three hours of cracking the fly fishing whip and no fish, I was getting bored. The metal fish stringer with its spring clips designed to hold ten large mouth baths was lying empty on the floor of the little flat bottom boat. Right there on the bank, I said, pointing to a clear spot on the bank of the lake. A large cotton mouth water moskin was enjoying the sun. He paid no attention to me. After all, he had all the venom. I wondered if he'd eat a fly. I worked my rod then lay that fly an inch from the nose of that serpent. There was no movement. No movement except a large black forked tongue began to shoot in and out. He was ignoring me. I decided to teach him a lesson. I drew the line back and like a whip, then snapped and popped him in the head. This got his attention, he coiled up. The secret to popping a whip is throwing it out and pulling it back at the right time with the right force. A smart snake would have run, I continued. This was a big, poisonous dummy. I popped him again, harder, and all he did was look around. Pop, pop, pop! I was hitting him fast, one right after the other. You'll feel this one, I said, and I put an extra tug in just at the right time. The hook set in the middle of the snake. When I tugged, the snake flew, wagging four feet above the water. I fully understood the namesake of the snake as he hyperextended his mouth by unhinging his jaw, revealing his white fangs and a puffy white throat. All this as I saw the cottonmouth flying through the air and into the boat. The fishing line was flopping and looping, giving me no control of the flight of the snake. I thought about jumping out of the boat. I wondered if that snake had kinfolk beneath the surface. I managed to move away from him as he landed right in the middle of the 12-foot flat bottom boat. The hook was still in the middle of his back. I looked for my pistol, but I really didn't want to shoot holes in the bottom of the boat. The snake lay between me and my 32 automatic pistol anyway. At least I had sense enough to keep holding on to my rod. I quickly drew in the line. The long, flexible rod kept the excited, wiggling snake a safe distance away. Now, if the hook would hold, I could pick the monster up and put him back into the water. A fly rod is flexible. That means it bends. As I begin to lift the rod, the rod began to bend. The weight of the snake and the flexing of the rod made the snake get closer and closer. Finally, the snake saw the water, and we both agreed it was time to end the game. He slithered over the side of the boat. I shook the rod a few times, which freed the hook which freed Mr. Cottonmouth Water Moskin. A mosquito bites William's ankle. One of many bites he receives that night and he does not feel. The mosquitoes feast on him without his knowledge. The wheelchair pulls up to the sign marking the border of Smith County. This sign is 10 feet before the next one identifying the Sabine River where the two-lane bridge begins and the shoulder of the road disappears. With no cars in sight, William rolls onto the bridge. The concrete curb is a foot tall, and the rail some 15 inches beyond. William's plan is to get out on the bridge, collapse his wheelchair, and climb onto the curb, holding onto the railing. Then he can swing his legs over the side and sit, almost normal, looking down upon his friends. After a while, he can yell at them, maybe even get someone to throw a beer up to him. When he's almost to his destination, he sees a pair of headlights approaching. He thinks. He looks at the curb, then back at the car. He realizes it's not a car, but an 18-wheeler crossing Pump Station Lake and coming fast. 
He spins his wheelchair around to race the oncoming truck, struggling to get out of the traffic lane. He makes it to the end of the bridge, but not far enough. He fully expects that his life will very shortly come to an end. His head hurts from a loud sound suddenly blaring in his ears. Truckers blast into his air horn, swerves to 20 tons of big rig in an attempt to miss the traveler. Big trucks are not made to share the road with wheelchairs. William sees red and amber running lights along the side of the truck, then miraculously sees the tail lights. He's still alive. Before he has a chance to rejoice, he's caught in the air turbulence of the truck and spins out of control. His hands are useless as he tumbles and the chair bounces away, landing next to the sign for the river. He finds himself lying, centered in the southbound lane, his useless legs pointing north, his aching head pointing south. He lies there, breathing, thinking, trying to regroup. No way are we going swimming with alligators and snakes, the girls say. Don't worry, I answer. We're going to the big lake where people have been swimming for years. I tried to reassure them and noticed that I was speaking louder than before. The drone sound was loud because a buzzing sound, something like standing on an airstrip with ten planes grinding their propellers against the air. I was bitten by a mosquito, then another. We walked faster and the buzzing was all around us. I brushed off layers of mosquitoes. I brushed layers of mosquitoes off the kids with a towel, and we ran to the swimming hole. When we arrived, no questions were asked and no protests given. We all went into the water, hoping the mosquitoes were not deep sea divers and not thinking about where mosquitoes come from. Only by going underwater in one place and coming up in another could any of us get any relief, and then only for a short while. When the inside of your nose is tickled by mosquitoes, it's time to go. We had had all the fun we could stand. The two wine coolers from my pockets turned into mosquito repellent. I poured them over the kids. Maybe what little alcohol they contained would offer some protection. We turned tail and ran down the road. In my many years of going to the river, I have never heard mosquitoes like that, and my memory of the lakes would be much different than those of my daughter. Now family members venture to the Schamburger Lakes on weekends and holidays. At night, men stand around campfires and change the color of the flames. Except when someone brings out a machine gun or a rapid-fire 12-gauge shotgun for demonstration, it's quite calm around the lakes, especially calm when the campfires have turned to ashes and everyone has gone home. Misty notices the sound change to the gentle whine of asphalt as the pump station lake bridge ends. Then, in less than three breaths, she again hears the thump, the thump, the thump. She's now on the Sabine River Bridge. The thump, the thump, the thump. Her headlights show something in the road at the end of the bridge. It's not anything big. Uh, maybe a jacket, she says to herself as she slows down, straining to see. William sits up, facing her. His eyes meet hers, and time is frozen for a split second. She screams and jerks the steering wheel, putting the car onto two wheels, sliding to the wrong side of the road. She regains control of her car, but not control of her senses. All she wants to do is run, run, run. Today, she would quickly dial 911 on her cell phone and report the emergency, or she would be in the middle of a text message and wonder what the extra th thump was. Tonight, however, she drives into the city of Winona and sees a blinking yellow light. She pulls up to a phone booth. Zero is all her shaking hand can dial in pre-911 days. Operator! She screams into the phone. There's a man sitting in the road. He's lying there. And just before I got to him, he sat up and looked right into my eyes. Oh, God, he looked right into my eyes. The number to the sheriff's office is 59353. I'm on a pay phone. There's a man in the road. Let me connect you to the sheriff's department. Smith County Sheriff's Office. There's a man sitting in the road. He's lying there, and just as I got to him, he sat up and looked into my eyes. What's your location? I'm, I'm at a, a little gas station in Winona. Is the man lying in the road in Winona? No, he's on a bridge outside of town, maybe a couple of miles. What direction? Direction? He looked right into my eyes. Uh, are you on 155 or Highway 16? One, 
155, Misty says, shaking her head. Oh, that will be the Department of Public Safety, says the dispatcher. I will connect you. Highway Patrol. It's a new voice. There's someone in the road. He sat up and looked at me. I, I think I may have hit him. Are you on Highway 155? Yes, she answered. It's been reported. An officer is en route. A few more questions and answers, and Misty hangs up the phone. She walks out of the phone booth and sits on an old wooden bench. She does not know eight years later a football player will burn up his Mercedes ten feet from where she's sitting. There are two major differences between a human and all the other animals that get run over by automobiles and trucks, and that is the size of the victim and the thickness of the skin. Neither is an advantage to the human race. Human skin is rather frail in comparison to most hides and is easily torn apart as the body twists, turns, and rolls under a motor vehicle. As for size, a cow or horse usually gets knocked aside or over the top of a car, whereas a human fits nicely under most front bumpers. Dogs and cats, being fairly small, get most of their damage from tires. Many dogs and cats can be seen in the rearview mirror after rolling under a car, surviving and virtually unscathed. Some learn. The ones that don't will suffer tire damage someday. People do not fare as well under a car. We have long bones that snap like toothpicks under a 2,000-pound auto press. These sharp, jagged, broken bones become entangled with flesh as the body is rolled and crushed. The result is a crumpled pile of what used to be a human. The thump, the thump, the thump came the car behind Misty. That one did not swerve. It did not miss William. The thump. I'm not sure if Misty hit William or not. I do know that she and the driver of the next car will forever see the nightmare of a lump of clothing lying on a dark road turn into a living human being, sitting up, eyes glowing in the headlights, and looking them eye to eye. Accident or suicide? We'll never know for sure. I ruled accident. End of chapter 7. Rolling on the river. I will emphasize now I have never seen the mosquitoes that bad down at the river before or after that one event.